to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the men and women of your army are on the alert to defend our nation, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture. Welcome to the big picture. I'm Captain Carl Zimmerman, here to tell you more about your United States Army. Last week on our program, we showed you how the Army Medical Corps protects and saves the lives of our fighting men. Today, we want you to meet the clergyman in uniform, the Army Chaplain. The importance of the work of the Army Chaplain is recognized today as never before in American military history. Now, the big picture and the Army Chaplain. In the Army, when a soldier complains of his troubles, it is a common expression to say, tell it to the chaplain. This expression is symbolic of the soldier's practice of looking to the chaplain as a constant and constructive advisor. Every man who has ever been in service knows that if there is an injustice, the chaplain can be counted on to take steps to correct it. If the complaint is unjustified, even by only being a sympathetic listener, the chaplain may still be able to be of some help. In July of last year, the 176th anniversary of the chaplain's service in the Army was marked in Tokyo by General Matthew Ridgway, accompanied by Mrs. Ridgway, as he unveiled the bronze plaque commemorating the occasion. Listed on the plaque, are the names of U.S. Army chaplains who gave their lives for God and country in the Korean conflict. The importance of the work of the chaplain is recognized today as never before in our military history. An executive order of the president states that it is the policy of the government to encourage and promote the religious, moral, and recreational welfare and character guidance of persons in the armed forces. The military chaplain has a long history, as old as the history of military operations in America. There were chaplains attached to many of the forces engaged in early struggle against the Indians and the French. During the Revolutionary War, it was quite natural for units of the Revolutionary Militia to march off to battle with the town clergyman, who became the chaplain. From those early beginnings have come a clearly defined and supported chaplain's service so that today the army chaplain living and working with the troops is one of the greatest morale factors in war. To prepare him for his job, there is special training for the clergyman in uniform at chaplain school. Here he undergoes basic training to toughen his body and his endurance, just as any other soldier. There are many hours of classroom work and after-class study and professional training. And on the last day at chaplain school, a graduation ceremony. Regulations describe the army chaplain's duties as similar to those performed by clergymen in civilian life, modified by the distinctive conditions attached to the military life. Your army chaplain is first and foremost a clergyman in every sense of the word, a moral leader which the cross or the tablets of the law that he wears at all times as a part of his uniform singles him out to be. You will be at the side of the fallen soldier to offer aid and comfort. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for thy guidance. Let this people be a humble people. Let us be humble in spirit, but strong in the conviction of the right, steadfast to endure sacrifice, and brave to achieve a victory of liberty and a lasting peace. Amen. Before receiving his army commission, 
he must be endorsed as a duly ordained or qualified clergyman by a recognized ecclesiastical agency. As an officer of your army, the chaplain has rank without command. He is entitled to all the privileges and advantages of rank, but he may not command troops. Despite his rank, however, he is addressed as chaplain. But more than most civilian clergymen, he is at once a pastor, organizer, counselor, missionary, and military officer. During World War II, 8,141 chaplains served in the army and distinguished themselves in all theaters of the war, winning the acceptance and support of all ranks. 2,395 decorations were awarded to World War II army chaplains. Following the past war, army chaplains have taken a more important place in military life by serving on character guidance councils, welfare fund councils, clemency boards. In this way, they exert moral influence upon military life, which is in keeping with the desires of the American people. As a nation, we are traditionally concerned for our youth. When it becomes necessary for large numbers of our young manhood to enter military service, we'd like them to have a moral environment that will strengthen their character during their period of service. The absence of normal home and hometown restraints for these young people calls for an effective religious program within your army and capable religious advisors who can help make sure that men returning from military service will be as good or better men than when they went in. It has been necessary for the totalitarians to attack and stifle religion because such faith represents the antithesis of everything they teach. Your army wants its soldiers to be morally as well as physically prepared to fight the enemy. That purpose is stated by Secretary of the Army, Frank Pace, Jr. I have been Secretary of the Army now for slightly over two years. In that period of time, two things have stood out in my mind as being important to a great army. The first of those two is that the army, considering its responsibilities in terms of discipline, still in a democracy must consider the development and rights of the individual. Towards that end, we have constantly striven in as big an organization as the army to recognize the individual person as an individual. We have done that by recognizing the development of the spiritual. And I'm happy to say that uh, our chapels have been crowded, that uh, men have shown a greater interest in the moral and the spiritual than at any time in Army history. We have tried to raise the educational level of the individual. And we have tried always, in terms of developing leadership at all levels in the Army, to place emphasis upon that individual's responsibility as a part of the team. The second factor that has loomed large in my mind in creating a great Army is to recognize that we train a man not only as a soldier, but as a citizen. Many of our men were, are with us for only two years. Then they return to civilian life. If the Army can make that man better ready to meet the responsibilities of citizenship, then I think they will have created not only a better soldier, but also a man who is better ready to meet the responsibilities of the America of today and of the future. That is largely the job of the Army chaplain. The religious life of an Army installation is very similar to that of a civilian community. Sabbath and weekday services, Bible classes, Sunday school, organ playing and choir singing are all part of the program. Participation in religious activities in the Army is always purely voluntary. Although Army chapel buildings are not elaborate, they are neat, well maintained, well located on the post, and can quickly be put to use for appropriate religious services for soldiers of each of the three major faiths. Your army has authorized a ratio of one chaplain to every 850 men. However, the actual figures indicate 
that if more chaplains were available for military service, religious opportunities would be extended and strengthened. In addition to every man to whom he is assigned, there may be on the average at least one dependent of that man to whom the chaplain may render service. Besides conducting religious services, the chaplain administers the sacraments of his faith, officiates at baptisms, weddings, funerals. He visits hospitals. Many a soldier has been cheered by a visit such as this. Sorry, we're fresh out of racing forms this morning. Here, try this for your higher education. Fred, how do you feel? Swell. Good. Here's a new one for you. Thanks. Tim, here's the cash for your ration check allowance. And your wife's allotment came through. Oh, thanks, Chaplain. That really takes a load off my mind. She sends her love, too. Thanks a lot. Well, what'd you run into? Busted my leg in my first parachute jump. I'll bet you landed stiff-legged. I guess so. I knew better, but I forgot. Well, I was luckier on my first jump. I only sprained both my ankles. Say, did you? Yeah, forgot my lesson. Landed like a stick, plain dumb. Chaplains offer comfort to all men who have troubles. Those in army prisons, too. As a counselor, the chaplain advises the puzzled, comforts the troubled, and aids the distressed. He deals with broken marriages, empty pocketbooks, homeless families. The only man directly assigned to helping the chaplain in his work is his assistant. The ideal assistant should be a good clerk, be able to play the organ or conduct choir practice, know how to drive and repair an automobile, and be well equipped to deal with other individuals. In order to meet these requirements, your army has made provision for enlisted personnel to be designated as Qualified Chaplain's Assistant. Courses of instruction for these men are given at the Chaplain School. Chaplains take an active part in an organized character guidance program. In his lectures, known as the Chaplain's Hour, which is part of regular training for the soldier, he confines what he has to say to the realm of ethics, responsibility, and morality, and not religion. When large numbers of troops leave American shores for overseas assignment, you may be sure that at least one chaplain accompanies them. It is difficult for the civilian to realize the very great extent to which most present-day chaplains have become an integral part of the military life. This is illustrated by the wearing of the uniform, which not only identifies the chaplain as a member of the team, but also indicates that he is committed to the same hardships and sacrifices as his comrades. In battle, the chaplain is a soldier unarmed, and yet not unarmed. For what better weapon can a man carry into combat than courage and faith? Overseas, the place of worship is entirely dependent upon what is available. It may be a bright new chapel at Incheon, Korea, or deeper into the combat zone, a war-scarred church, inspiring nevertheless to those men who come to pray. Close to the front, it may be a tent, just like other army tents, except for the sign. For some men in special situations, there isn't even that much. And so the chaplain, following his responsibility for providing spiritual guidance to soldiers who need it most, comes to them. The soldiers who have seen battle, no matter of what faith, welcome the chaplain, who at once starts preparations for a service. The altar is strange. It comes out of a suitcase and is set up on the hood of a jeep. The church, too, is different, a field marked by shell craters. Instead of an organ for musical accompaniment, 
there is the sound of artillery fire all through the service, coming from just over the top of the hill. When a chaplain stands before his congregation, he is not only a man of the cloth, but a soldier himself among soldiers, a man who knows the sights and sounds of combat and the importance of a sudden fire mission. The whole setting is unique, and yet in essence, it may not be so very different from a service back home. The same divine truths, the old familiar hymns, the prayers of an ancient church. Only this pastor and his flock are all in uniform. Because he alone of all army officers lacks military authority to enforce his orders, the chaplain cannot compel men to attend religious services. He cannot make them come to him for personal counseling. And if they do, he cannot insist that they take his advice. A capable chaplain, however, has much to offer his unit. Taking full advantage of his opportunities, there is practically no limit to the good he can accomplish. He is not only a spiritual advisor, but also a friend to the fighting man. An exchange of greetings around a campfire, the feeling of comradeship, sharing a few moments of frontline relaxation, all these strengthen the bond between the chaplain and his men. Something of his own spiritual serenity is transferred to the men by the chaplain as he drops by to pay a social call on a group of street fighting infantrymen who've just taken a town. Or passing out cigarettes, magazines, and a hearty smile to the weary members of an artillery gun crew. His visit is most welcome in the forward area where the men of a tank team are about to start out on a hazardous patrol mission. As a missionary, the chaplain comes into contact daily with hundreds of young men, some of whom have never been in a house of worship, many of whom do not belong to a church or synagogue. He has an opportunity to counsel these men, to bring them into the church if they so desire, to tie them to an organized religion which can be a source of strength to them for the rest of their lives. Serving with troops overseas, the chaplain has another important responsibility. Just as the American serving in foreign lands is a personal ambassador, so also is his chaplain, by virtue of the uniform he wears and the insignia upon it, a representative of the American religious tradition to every citizen of a foreign land with whom he comes in contact. Then, the chaplain turns from his work with the living to conduct memorial services for those men who have paid the supreme sacrifice to the cause of peace. The final blessings are invoked for all, for American heroes, for South Koreans, whose infant republic was invaded and who fought and died to save it from the aggressors, for those who knelt before the blessed sacrament, for those of all faiths, who live by the Sermon on the Mount. For those who upheld the teachings of the Torah and worship before the Star of David. There is hope for the world as long as there are men who will bear arms for the right to pray together. For the right to observe Passover. For the right to celebrate Mass. There is hope for the world, as long as there are men such as these, who will go wherever the soldier goes to lead him in prayer. Today we're telling you about our army chaplains. We have one of them with us now. Chaplain Edward R. Martin, First Army Chaplain, Governor's Island, New York. Well, Chaplain, uh, to what do you attribute the new recognition paid the Army Chaplain? 
I attribute it to the work of the older chaplains and also to the chaplaincy of World War II. World War II? Yes, the uh, greater number of chaplains that the great increase in number of chaplains that worked with the men in the uh, World War II gave them an opportunity to go with the men to the front lines and in the trenches to counsel and help them. The greater work has been shown, showed its results in World War II. Well, how does this work, Chaplain? Well, in, after the World War II, the, in 1947, Due to the work of our older chaplains and to the chaplain's hour that had been established, we started the new program of character guidance. Character guidance? Well, would you tell us about that? It's a long program. You're asking for a lot, but I'll cut it down to this. The nucleus of the program is to teach the young soldier that he is a moral being, that he has specific responsibility not only to himself, but to others. The initial work in the program is the chaplain's work. And because of that, we are now training officers. We have a specific part, not only in the basic training, but also throughout the whole life of the soldier while he is in service. Well, how about the results of this program? Results have been marvelous. Wherever the program is in force, your AWOL rate is practically nil, and our stockades are practically empty. So you see, the good work is done. This program is not only the chaplain. The chaplain is the beginning, but it takes in every officer, and every man in the Army is an integral part. It takes years for the completion of the program. From his natural rights, natural laws, which finally butt out in the beautiful product of a good first-class citizen soldier. Well, now, is this soldier coming to the chaplain when he's in trouble, Father? They certainly come to them, even as army chaplain, where I have nothing to do with troops. We find them every day. We come with their troubles, and if they come with their troubles, then we can help them. It's where the, cha where the soldier fails to go to the chaplain for counsel that his real trouble begins. Well, I know that there are many mothers and fathers of soldiers watching this program today, of men and women in the Army. Uh, certainly, you have a message for them. Yes, to you, mothers and fathers, there is a message to you. The thing is that in the Army, you need to have no fear. And now I'm talking of 27 years of experience without losing a day in that Army. We have every protection, moral, physical, for your children. Give us your children and leave them in our hands, and we will turn them back to you as good, if not better, than when they came to us. In what way, Father, can the mothers and fathers help the soldiers' morale? Yes, there's a first thing is on visits. Too often, visits are made the day after the man is inducted into the Army. I ask you parents, give the Army a little chance to clothe and bed and induct the man in the Army, say about four weeks at least. Then come and visit him, and you'll find a happy, contented young man. There's another thing, too. When they go on, to foreign service or to a station away from home. Be careful of the letters you write. Letters can do more harm than anything else. Send them cheerful letters. If perhaps they should have trouble, and this is a point that uh, parents ought to realize. When you have difficulties, in the family, no matter what they are, and you feel that the son should be called home, see your nearest Red Cross chapter. They've done marvelous work. They are actually just the same as a chaplain to your son. They're chaplains to you. There's a more that they can do to help you than anything else. Remember that, your local Red Cross chapter. 
before you write that troublesome letter to your son. Well, Father, I know that that's excellent advice for the mothers and fathers watching our big picture program. I know, too, that uh, you saw some action in World War II, and you'd like to talk about this chaplain in Korea, wouldn't you? Am I proud of them? They're doing a wonderful job. They're there with your sons, right in the front lines. Yesterday, another chaplain just gave his life to be with your men. They've suffered wounds. They're there willingly. And if I could only show you some of the letters, had I known this, I'd have made it just a program of the letters that I've received and that we are receiving from men in Korea. The wonderful help and courage that chaplains have given to your men, to your sons. They're wonderful. We need a lot more of those chaplains. Yes, Father, we do need more chaplains, don't we? We certainly are in need of more chaplains due to the fact that most of them that are now in service have served in World War II and in Korea. To you, younger clergymen in civil life, we appeal to you, if you are under 38 years of age, to render a service to God and your country by coming into the service. Details can be received from the Chief of Chaplains, Washington 25, D.C. There's a greatest challenge, greater than that of your own ministry at home, to serve the men in the army on the battlefield. Thank you. Thank you, Father Martin. I think all of us have a much better understanding of the work the Army chaplain is doing for our soldiers, no matter where he is stationed. We'd like you to be with us next week for another big picture program when we'll talk about the women in the Army, the WACs, the nurses, and the medical specialists. This is Captain Carl Zimmerman inviting you to be with us then. to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the men and women of your army are on the alert to defend our nation, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture. Welcome to The Big Picture, presented by your United States Army. I'm Captain Carl Zimmerman. Today, The Big Picture tells the story of the Army combat team. What happens in one day of war? Fighting in Korea, over mountainous country, often in freezing weather, against an enemy far superior in numbers, demanded a new combat technique. Well, today, The Big Picture shows you how the Army met that demand, fighting as a team, using firepower against manpower. One more day of war, and the news is lost in a two-line communique from the battlefront. But behind this colorless report is the story of the world's greatest fighting team, the American Army Combat Team, a tough and mobile assault force which can hit anywhere, anytime. This day of war has not been won by the infantryman alone, fighting his way across the nameless mountains of Korea, nor by the strategists behind him. For today, America's military answer to war is firepower, teamwork, and mobility, a shattering land, sea, and air combat machine 
geared and equipped to do any size job in the shortest time and with the fewest casualties possible. Guns of all caliber laying down a hail of fire. Other armies commit vast manpower resources to battle and rely on man's expendability. The American army fights a war of firepower instead of manpower. Providing that firepower, backed by the finest weapons in the world, is the Army Combat Team, a combined assault force which relies on the sheer weight of its steel and explosives for its maximum effectiveness. The 8th Army in Korea, called the greatest army the world has ever known, earned that honor fighting the firepower and combat team technique. Korea, with its snow, mountains, cold, and many military problems, has evolved a new concept for waging war. That concept is to have the best weapons, providing the biggest volume of firepower, and to keep the fighting units flexible and mobile enough to be used quickly and effectively. The combined weapons of the United States Army are superior to those of any other army in the world. The M1 Garand rifle, basic weapon of the infantrymen. The Browning automatic rifle ripping off 500 rounds a minute and providing accurate fire against enemy soldiers. Rocket launchers, better known as bazookas, capable of punching a hole through nine inches of steel and blasting fortifications, gun emplacements, and tanks. Machine guns, the backbone of infantry firepower, light and heavy, able to deliver large volumes of continuous fire. Mortars, workhorse of the front line, ready to lob shells up and over the enemy's defenses. And the miracle weapon of them all, the recoilless rifle, an easy firing weapon packing the punch of an artillery piece. These are the weapons which give the army command of the battlefield, weapons unequaled in the world for firepower, mobility, and accuracy. And backing the infantrymen and those weapons is the rest of the combat team, tanks, artillery, and planes of the Air Force. Patrols are sent out to find the enemy as preparations for combat begin. Observation posts make their reports, enemy bunkers are sighted, and the patrol leader refers their position to the artillery. Quiet is shattered as salvo after salvo saturates the enemy position. From somewhere in the air, the sound of a lone plane is heard, and the waiting infantrymen on the ground know that a last-minute air reconnaissance is being made. These army observers take to the air in small aircraft to spot targets for artillery and obtain information about the enemy. Carrying no armament of any kind, these grasshoppers daily penetrate far behind enemy lines, gathering intelligence reports. The attack hour approaches and the combat team readies itself. into the enemy as round after round is fed into the guns. Tank engines roar into action, drowning out the whine of artillery shells overhead, and together the armored infantry unit moves out. The tanks and the infantrymen fight together as a team, making up for each other's shortcomings. Protecting the men on foot, the tanks probe and patrol ahead, ready to defend the team of soldiers at its side.
At the same time, the ground troops protect their tank from enemy fire and assist it by directing its gunfire to strategic areas. A telephone connected to the back of the tank welds the separate members into a fighting team. By fire and movement, our army advances. While tanks and machine gun crews lay down a blanket of fire to keep the enemy pinned down, the attacking force pushes forward, killing and routing the enemy and knocking out emplacements. If enemy resistance cannot be broken by the soldier on foot, the tank is there to move ahead and blast the objective with its heavier firepower. Aiding the infantryman in his dangerous mission are the mortars and the artillery, which bring down a curtain of death just in front of the advancing troops. Directed by their own forward observers, the artillery and mortar units inch their fire slowly forward, wiping out opposition from the path of the tanks and the infantry. As the frontline men advance, so the gunners adjust their sights and continue to pour out the bombardment. Supply roads are blocked and reinforcements are sealed off. When difficult terrain makes it impossible for our tanks to fulfill their task, and the enemy cannot be flushed from his positions, teamwork in combat again answers the emergency. The word is passed back for tactical air support. Awaiting their call to action are the F-51s and jets, which carry the firepower technique into the air and support the ground forces with pinpoint bombing. Integrated with the ground tank infantry artillery team, these planes add to the combined firepower. They are armed with six 50 caliber machine guns and 10 five inch rockets. The planes also carry napalm and demolition bombs. The pilots receive their final instructions and get up to the minute information on the latest tactical situation. Then, the pilots join the combat team. In a matter of minutes, the planes take off for the combat zone to do from the air what cannot be done from the ground. Mustang fighters, veterans of World War II, are still preferred for cover by ground forces because they can remain over the lines longer than the faster jets. With speed and accuracy, they dive on the target, strafing the enemy, bombing and burning him out. can soften up the enemy within yards of their infantry buddies. One of these devices is the air ground liaison team. Talking directly to the pilots by radio from a jeep, a ground observer helps the planes pinpoint the target. Hand in hand, the ground and air units join in combined attack using teamwork to keep the assault rolling. More than ever before, the Army is today using the air to link its fighting units. The role of the helicopter in combat has far outgrown the expectations of the strategists who first used it, and more and more these copters are being used for battle missions. Reinforcements rush to weak points in the line. The wounded are speedily carried to medical aid strapped to the sides of the helicopter. To the men on the line, these copters have become messengers of life 
or death. Rushing ammunition to cut off units, evacuating the wounded, and carrying the fight across impassable terrain, the helicopters strengthen the lifeblood of the fighting man. Assault teams fully armed for battle can hop from mountain to mountain, preparing the way for the troops that follow. In warfare today, mobility of firepower is the key to victory. Recognizing this important factor, the Army has made the regimental unit its core in combat. To act quickly in battle, the Army has given the regimental unit its own command and the necessary firepower backing to do any job. These regimental combat teams assigned their own tank and artillery forces have become the backbone of America's fighting army. Instead of an unwieldy army organized for action at divisional or corps level, America's fighting force is now split into fast-moving, highly mobile attack teams of regimental strength, which have their own supporting artillery and heavy weapons units. In General Ridgway's own words, the new tactical trend is this. We are not interested in real estate. We are interested only in inflicting maximum casualties on the enemy with minimum losses to ourselves. To do this, we must wage a war of maneuver, slashing at the enemy when he withdraws and fighting delaying actions when he attacks. Doing this job is the Armored Task Force Team. It's a technical job taking all the resources of science and industry to meet its demands. Observation of the enemy is no longer a soldier looking through field glasses. It's a mathematical process run by soldier scientists. Delicate instruments which see the flash of enemy guns and give their location in terms of a compass reading, making it a matter of seconds before an artillery gun pounds the target into silence or microphones used as listening posts. Cables lead from each microphone. And the press of a button gives the army a battery of ears. From the recording of the sound impulses, calculations are made which give the range and direction of the enemy artillery. And in the world of weather, the radio son, an instrument which continuously transmits humidity and pressure readings, is carried aloft by hydrogen-filled balloons. Technicians on the ground listen in to the weather above and forecasts are made. Radar is used to search out enemy mortar shells. When a shell is spotted, it is tracked by radar and its arc of flight revealed. Plotting backwards, a specialist trace the original path of the shell back to the enemy mortar and another target is ready to be destroyed. This is science behind the combat team. Science is also used by the Signal Corps, fighting its war of communication in the thick of combat, stringing telephone lines. snapping battle orders over spluttering hand radios, acting as the Army's nerve system, linking the individual efforts into a master plan. However hard the going, the long tentacles of communication are stretched out. If ground obstacles get too tough for the pole climbers, they lay the wire by plane. If it can't be done the modern way, then they will do it the old way. Sturdy, sure-footed mules often replace the jeep in the rugged country of Korea. Using everything they can, Signal Corps linemen get the job done. Communication with forward areas not yet linked by permanent lines is effectively established by the use of the pigeon service. In unique situations, pigeons are used on infantry and tank patrols into enemy territory when radio silence must be maintained or when foot messengers would be exposed to heavy enemy fire. Forward command posts also use pigeon carriers to send messages back to Corps headquarters.
When released, the bird circles high to get its bearings and then sets its course straight for its home loft at Corps headquarters. It's another part of the teamwork in combat. The information gets through and a new fire mission begins. Making the advance possible too is the Army Engineer Corps, the builders and wreckers who drill and blast a path through the mountains. The Army construction workers do their part to keep the fighting machine rolling smoothly. Searching for mines and removing their sting. Combat engineers must devise field expedients like the construction of this aerial tramway to conquer the mountains of Korea. Using local labor, a half-inch steel cable is hauled to the upper terminus more than 2,000 feet away. At the hilltop, deep holes are drilled into solid rock to provide firm anchorage for the track cable. A winch on a two and one half ton truck is used to put the required tension on the cable spanning the gulf. Again improvising, engineers modify a rear wheel of a three quarter ton truck to allow the vehicle's engine to serve as motive power for the traction cables which will raise and lower the sky car. Test runs are carried out and communication is established between the terminals. Then, supplies are loaded on the tramway for the first trip along its 2,000-foot cable up to the 500-foot summit. By such methods as these, the transportation time for a difficult journey is reduced from hours to a smooth glide of several minutes. The engineers fulfill another vital function. Further strengthening the combat team, the Army has its Airborne Assault Force, a rugged fighting unit in itself, equipped with artillery and heavy weapons. Held in the rear for special assignments, it can hurtle from out of the sky a complete regiment fully armed for combat. Before the paratroopers join the battle, there is equipment to be checked and prepared for the drop. Chutes must be examined and folded with precision. Artillery and other heavy weapons must be lashed to their landing boards. Huge C-119 transports wait to take on their cargo. The equipment they carry is heavy and space counts. Special rollers make it easy to load the heavy equipment onto the waiting plane. And the men are given a final briefing before takeoff. from the pilot signaling the drop zone has been reached and one by one the men hit the silk followed by their weapons. In three and a half seconds the full load of heavy weapons is out of the plane and quartermaster airborne soldiers jump out after them. After the drop 
It takes three minutes to unlash a Jeep and drive it away. And the 105 millimeter howitzer is ready for action in 20 minutes. More and more men arrive, quickly reforming and taking up the attack. In this way, the Army continues its fight, circumventing fixed enemy defenses and severe natural obstacles. By using parachute drops, fighting units cut off from the main fighting body can be kept fully supplied with food and weapons. The airborne combat team is a strong right arm that can stretch anywhere to deliver its Sunday punch. This is teamwork paying off. The Army of today, fighting a war of mobility, speed, and effectiveness, packing more firepower than any other nation in the world. Exchanging fire for flesh. The United States Army Combat Team. That's your Army in action today, fighting with firepower and teamwork. Now we'd like you to meet Lieutenant Colonel Robert B. Pridgen of Henderson, North Carolina. Colonel Pridgen recently returned from Korea, where he served as a battalion commander for 13 months with the 17th Infantry Regiment of the Army's 7th Division. Well, Colonel Pridgen, you can tell how our Army put this firepower and teamwork into action in Korea. Yes, I sure can, Carl. We have the finest combat team in the world. It really makes our soldiers have confidence in the Army to look around them as they move into the attack, see tanks, infantry, everything we have moving right along with them. Let's talk about our weapons. How did ours compare with the enemy's? Well, our weapons are far superior to anything that the enemy has shown with us to date. Uh, they are faster, they're more easily operated, more easily transportable, portable, more mobile. In fact, it's, uh, our weapons are far superior to any that the enemy has used. Uh, Army aviation over there in Korea, this helicopter and the small plane, they were part of the combat team too, weren't they? Well, yes, the uh, helicopter it has really a, a step in the right direction, I think. Uh, we used it in Korea, in my unit primarily, for evacuation. A man may be seriously wounded on a hill. If we had to use a normal litters to take him down, it would take a matter of hours. By calling for a helicopter, he's evacuated to safety and to an aid station or hospital in a matter of minutes. Also, they occasionally bring up mail and hot rations to the troops on top of those hills. Well, certainly the helicopter was an important part of our combat team in Korea, wasn't it? Yes, I saw that helicopter. I didn't have any experience with it. It's very good. It will transport a squad and with equipment to the top of those hills. Whereas if the squad had to walk, it would take six to 10 hours. They can now get there in a matter of minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a good deal of time to get up to the top of the hill over there, doesn't it? Especially when you have to fight your way up, Colonel. It may take days, Carl, at times. Mm -hmm. Well, now, uh, let's talk about the methods of fighting. How did our methods compare with the enemy's? Well, the enemy normally attacked at night. He attacked in waves, utilizing masses of troops. The first wave would be armed only with hand grenades. They'd come running up the hill, throwing grenades, screaming, blowing bugles, beating drums, anything to try and put fear in our people in the dark and make them run. They ran right into our machine guns with uh, just get mowed down, keep coming. Mm -hmm. That's quite a contrast. We, we have a good deal more respect for the individual soldier, haven't we? And that's why we use this firepower. That's true. We utilize our firepower a lot of times in place of personnel. Mm -hmm. Well, all in all, Colonel, how would you say this combat team worked out in Korea? To a great advantage, Carl, uh, due to the nature of the terrain in Korea, we could uh, more effectively employ our weapons and personnel by breaking the units down to smaller combat teams than trying to employ them in a great force. Thank you, Colonel. You've given us a good picture of how we put this teamwork and firepower onto the battlefield. That's the way we fight in a combat team. Units working together, welding their firepower into a great fighting machine that is your army today. Thank you, Colonel Bridgen, for being with us. Next week on our big picture, we'll tell you about the Army's citizen soldier. We'll talk about the information and education program. We'll point out how this soldier of ours has become 
the best informed, the best educated soldier in the world today. This is Captain Carl Zimmerman inviting you to be with us then.